Yeah, wars become very unpopular when your children come back in coffins. Oh my, your grandparents were different types of farmers and this is what you do when their chair gets in your way at a Starbucks two generations later. If there were cell phones in 1914, World War I would have stopped right then because people would have known I'm not the only one who's feeling this way. Hello, my name is Michael Ziger. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel because every week I'm speaking to the greatest minds uh, alive. And today my guest is the greatest neurobiologist in the world, Professor Robert Sapolsky. Hello, Professor. Hi, how are you? Yeah, thank you, more or less. Trying, trying to, to carry on. Well, it uh, must be difficult being in exile having to be in a place far from home, trying to put things back together. You know, um, it's, it's specifically uh, not easy to be in exile during that kind of turmoil, because now we are right in the moment when a lot of people are living and a lot of people are in the same situation and it's like a hurricane and it's, it's, it's even ironic how, how fast the world we used to uh, can, can collapse. And... Yeah, it's, well, Russia is going to lose all of its intelligentsia, all of its opposition. Yeah, wars become very unpopular when your children come back in coffins. That, that, that seems a good lesson of history. Uh, whoever has decided to invade Afghanistan, whether it's uh, USSR or USA, that that tends to be a problem. Then, um, yeah, you know, but it's it's sometimes. Um, I was all I was also sure that that any war um, cannot be popular when when people are facing uh, the consequences, but. Uh, during the last uh, months, at least, uh, I see that there is something, there is some psychological phenomena, um, or at least um, it looks like a, a psychological phenomena, and that's imperialism. That's uh, the fact that people love uh, uh, feeling a part of something bigger and stronger than themselves, that uh, uh, being a part of a huge, great empire that uh, if you say make Russia great again or America great again, and they and they feel happy because of that, and at the same time, if they don't have that, they feel nostalgia, or at the same time, if they are criticized for being colonial power, they feel insulted, and they uh, they call other nations and other countries, other people, um, that they are um, unthankful for all those uh, um, for all that help that they were grunting for many. What, what's, what's the nature of, of, that, of that feeling? Why people uh, want um, to be a part of the empire and w want it so bad? Well, I think an element that's very relevant in the case of Russia, um, in the case of the United States, in the case of the militant Islamic world is the word you used, humiliation. Once this was a great empire, the, the United States after World War II, Soviet Union, a thousand years ago, this entire planet was being ruled by Islamic uh, fiefdoms and the humiliation uh, so that the desire to join up with someone who promises the past. Putin, as you said, is entirely living in the past. But in the larger sense, why do people conform um, not all of them do, but the ones that do tend to have a personality style uh, built around they like hierarchy. Mm -hmm. They like very clear indications of it. And framing it more psychologically, 
um, uncertainty makes them very, very anxious. They want to know who's one step above, who's one step below. They want to know what the rules are for how they are supposed to interact with each one of them. And it is uh, people who are made very anxious by uncertainty, by ambiguity, are just attracted to not only conformity, but of the most you know, totalitarian conformity. Um, answers are very reassuring to a lot of people, no matter how true they are or not. Um, it's a very small sub subset of people who find a lack of answers to be exciting and stimulating because let's go explore. <laughs> Exploring is a scary thing to most people and thus the future is a scary thing to most people. So uh, is it only um, about some personal achievements, some personal success, uh, some um, uh, feeling of um, vulnerability or feeling of um, possibilities to achieve something because uh, uh, people who, who know uh, that they, they, they can achieve some result and they, they can do something themselves, they are more stable and people who are um, probably less successful, they, they want to rely on something. And at the same time, I, I guess, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's something about the pride. If, you, if you've got something to be proud of uh, on your own, you can be proud of your family, of your business, of your dog, of whatever. But if uh, the only thing you associate yourself with is your nation, and you can be, pr first of all, proud of the great empire, it means that, that you, you miss, you, you lack something. And when so much of what is being propagandized is a return to glory, it's not that one's nation be, can become the greatest it has ever been. It's not only the myth that things used to be great, Trump and the United States make America great again. America was not great for minorities. America was not great for women, all of that. So it's a mythology that there was greatness. And even more toxic is a mythology as to why the greatness disappeared, because it's always someone else's fault. It's always the big conspiracy, all of that. And this retroactive look at greatness, I mean, look at Look at Italy and Maloney just elected there, who's practically going to put up statues of Mussolini. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fear of your collective group being weakened is enormously frightening because people get a tremendous sense of power out of that. I, a classic neurobiological studies, cl classic psychology studies in the 1950s, they're in every single textbook out there. You sit somebody down and you show them three lines on a piece of paper. One line is way longer than the other two. It's totally obvious. And you say to them, which line is longer? And 99% of them will say, yeah, this line is longer. It's totally obvious. And these famous studies, you now sit somebody down with the two lines like that and the one longer one, and they're surrounded by 10 other people. And the other 10 people go first yeah. and they all say, oh, this one, this one is the shortest line. And the the studies that just like terrified people and like everybody learns in their introductory psychology class is about 75% of people would eventually go along and say, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. And yeah, it's really this one. Um, it's not by chance that this was the first of a number of styles of psychology studies done in the 1950s built around uh, psychologists who were refugees, Jewish refugees from Europe, of trying to figure out how in hell did Germany happen? How did Nazism happen? How did, how did conformity like that? What the research since then has shown is when the person says, oh, yes, 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 I was, I was silly. I don't know what I was thinking. Yes, that is the shortest. It comes in two forms. The first form is a public sort of conformity, 
where the person says, yes, 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 I was wrong. And when the study is over and 10 minutes later, you stop them in the hallway and you say, okay, what, what do you think? And they say, oh, this was obviously the longest one, but you know, I didn't want to make a fuss, anything like that. So I, I was mm -hmm. just, you know, why make trouble? <clears throat> And you do that study when somebody is in a brain scanner while that's going on. And the second, everyone else is saying, this is the shortest one, this is the shortest one. Parts of the brain associated with anxiety, with fear, with self-disgust, brain regions, the amygdala, the insular cortex activates until the person says, yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. This is actually the shortest one. Okay, that's fine. And an hour later, they're saying, yeah, whatever, that was crazy, but, you know, just needed to get along with those people. The really scary version is the subset who then show what they term private conformity. You get them a week later, you get them a month later, and you say, oh, so what was going on there? And a month later, they're saying, wow, I don't know what was wrong with me that I thought... And what's going on in the brains of them are much, much more interesting. As soon as everybody else says, oh, that's the longest one, you get activation of the same brain regions, anxiety, fear, disgust, all of that. But then what you begin to see a few minutes later is activation of the hippocampus, brain region associated with memory. You're trying to rewrite your memory. Mm -hmm. Remember, this one yeah. really looks shorter. And then a step after that, the most amazing thing is you see activation of the visual cortex. You're even going to like the part of your brain that's most connected with your eyes and say, remember, remember when you looked at that? Remember, idiot, you thought this looked longer? You really saw this one look longer. It's not just your memory. You actually saw this one looking longer. Do you remember? Do you remember? From now on, remember it that way. If you've got sort of parts of your brain built around, built around anxiety, uh, reconstructing your memory, reconstructing your visual experience, that's a really scary thing because that's somebody who a month later and 30 years later is going to be saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. War is peace. Uh, truth is lying. These people are responsible for all our problems. They are the conspirators, all of that. Once you get your brain rewriting your own internal history, and if that's a way to make the anxiety go away, that's, that's a disaster. So does it mean that that phenomenon could be generational? So the, the people who, who were exposed uh, to, to um, uh, decades of suppression are more vulnerable to conformity and, and would be the first to, to say, yes, we, we agree to everything. Absolutely. And what sort of child development studies show is those are the parents who are most likely to have what's called an authoritarian parenting style. Do this. Why? because I said so. Um, the world of difference between parenting styles of do whatever you want, you'll be wonderful, do whatever you want, I don't care, or do this, how come? Here's the thinking behind it. Here's what I'm thinking, what do you think? The parenting style built around that sort of conformity is the one that says do this because I say so. And what you've just done is built the next generation that's going to have the exact same style. And what would you say about um, so-called national characters? Because um, among, among um, journalists, uh, politologists, it's very popular uh, that, that many nations are predetermined to have uh, that or another political system. That, let's say, Russians have lived under dictatorship for so long, so that, that means that that's in, in their DNA. They, they should have a dictatorship. And uh, it applies to, to other countries, for, for example. Yeah, Americans are Democrats. Yeah, we know that. That's in their DNA. Uh, what, what can you tell about that? <laughs> Except ever since Trump was elected, yeah. um, 
in some cases, it might be a tiny, tiny bit in the DNA. Um, and that I think an awful lot of the people who Stalin killed in the gulags did not leave copies of their genes, but that's, that's mostly foolish. Um, in terms of the national character, sitting in America, um, I think is the greatest place to be skeptical that there really is no such thing as a strong national character because in the city that I live, the children in schools speak 70 different languages. Their parents came here. And what you see is by the children's generation, by the grandchildren's generation, they look just like any other American in terms of personality. There's no genetics of having a Somali national identity or a Korean or a whatever national identities are, are not biological phenomena. What are biological phenomena is how you act when you are surrounded by other people who think a certain way. And, you know, a great example of that studies looking at Islamic fundamentalism and trying to see what are the predictors of people who will say violence is okay, terrorism is okay. And the easy thing is to say, oh, obviously it's because if they're more religious, if they're more orthodoxly religious, if they're more fundamentalist. So let's see, how often do you pray? How often do you, do you believe this? Do you believe those are never predictors? What are the predictors are? How often do you do, do you do your praying in a mosque? surrounded by other people who think the same thing. When you look at American Christian fundamentalists who believe in things like violence is okay to stop abortion, it's not how often they pray. It's not how important they say God is in their life. It's how often they go to a church and are surrounded by people who think the same thing. We're sitting there saying those bastards. Those are the ones who are and responsible for everything. And before you know it, you're saying this one is really the longest line. It's in a group context, which is why you could come to a different country and in two generations, your children think completely different than your grandparents did. What's fascinating, of course, is where the cultural differences come from. Why is this the culture that everyone surrounding uses is the way to go? And, you know, obviously economic issues, obviously what happened in Russia in 1989 has a lot to do with what's going on right now. What amazes me is how long lasting some of these are. People who are descendants of people from the desert are more likely to have religions believing in one God. They are more likely to believe that being killed in battle get you, gets you into paradise. The entire planet is dominated by these religions that came out of the deserts in the Middle East. People who, who are descendants of rainforest people, their religions are more likely to have multiple gods. Mm -hmm. They don't have histories of war. And they have no belief that like, warfare gets you into heaven. And they've been <laughs> being destroyed by the desert monotheists for the last 800 years, which is what colonialism has been. And like, how does that? Your great, great, great grandparents were living in a rainforest in Indonesia versus your great, great, great grandparents were living in like the Sinai Desert. And you have a different culture you were brought up with is, is amazing. Another study, and this has been replicated, looking at different cultures and how xenophobic they are how hostile they are to outsiders, to immigrants, to strangers, all of that. And there's a bunch of predictors, economics, homogeneity of language, culture, religion, all of that. But another predictor, it's not a big one, but still a significant predictor is 500 years ago, how calm were infectious diseases in this population? If your culture had a long history of infectious diseases, you did not like outsiders showing up unless you taught your children. And your children talked to their children. And 500 years later, 
that's one of the significant predictors of how much hostility there is to immigrants. It's a tiny factor, but the fact that that's any factor at all is amazing. Um, another set of studies uh, which have been carried out in China, you know, anyone who's interested in cross-cultural psychology, things like that, what they always study is individualist cultures, which usually means the United States, and collectivist cultures, which usually means Southeast Asia. And looking at child rearing practices and, and unconscious processes and brain imaging and all of that. But then someone discovered, interestingly, um, where, where does the collectivist culture come from in Southeast Asia? It's from rice farming. Mm -hmm. um, rice farming, because you have to maintain aqueduct systems that are 100 miles long and take 50 villages cooperating along the way to maintain this. And they've been maintaining it for 2,000 years. In addition, um, when it's planting season, the entire village has to show up and everybody plants this person's land today and that person's land tomorrow and that and during harvesting it's this huge collectivist thing and this group began to study there's this one area of northern china it's very mountainous where what you see instead is wheat wheat farming mm -hmm. and wheat farming is not collectivist wheat farming is very individualistic so they've been studying the populations up there and those people are just as individualistic as americans growing up in new york city and they have they're totally different from the collectivist rice farmers they have different rates of inventing things and having patents and patent offices they have higher rates of innovation they have higher rates of divorce they've got the same divorce races in the west they have all these subtle psychological tests like draw me a diagram of you and the people who matter to you and people from individualist cultures draw themselves in the middle of the diagram and they get the biggest circle. People from like collectivist cultures, they're a little circle the same size as all the others. Maybe they're even smaller and it's off on the side. The wheat growing Chinese, big circle right in the middle all of that. Um, so this was a great science paper in the journal Science a few years ago. Mm -hmm. They did an experiment. They went into Starbucks in China and they set up an experiment where they would push two chairs together, back to back, blocking the way between two tables. And they would see this was a university town and they would see students coming in. And what you saw was not people who were rice farmers, these university students who were the grandchildren of rice farmers and universities who were the grandchildren of wheat farmers, the rice farmer kids, go towards that and they walk around the table. The wheat farmer ones go up to the two chairs and they pull them apart. Oh my, your grandparents were different types of farmers and this is what you do when their chair gets in your way at a Starbucks two generations later. You know, these national differences are, are very, very long lasting simply because every generation raises their children to have the same cultural values that they do and carry them on so they're but very long. Is it something like like genetic memory or it's uh, the set of values that are being uh, um, taught from generation to generation and it's the values I and mean, some of the most interesting studies um, look at child rearing practices in individualistic versus collectivist cultures. And within the first day of birth, an infant, if you were born in a collectivist culture and your mother is singing to you, on the average, she, she sings more softly. Individualist culture mothers sing their babies lullabies more loudly. They enunciate the words more. They hold their babies for a shorter length of time than collectivist mothers. If a baby is crying, the average number of seconds before an individualist culture mother picks up her baby is longer than a from your first day of life. You were already being trained with these cultural differences. And 
So all it does is take off from there. And as another example of it, which, which amazes me, you show someone a picture, a photograph of a complicated scene, a city scene, there's a lot going on and there's a person in the middle, but lots of other things happening. And you flash up this picture for half a second and you ask people, oh, what do you remember from the picture? And what you see is people from individualist cultures are more likely to remember the person in the middle. People from collectivist cultures are more likely to remember details around the side. So then you get this fancy machinery where you can see where the eyes are looking in that half second and looking in the center versus scanning the periphery. This is what your eye muscles are doing in a tenth of a second is a function of the culture you were brought up in. That's not just, oh, culture of values. That's constructing a brain that works differently depending on what your parents did to help construct your brain and what their parents did. Uh -oh. <laughs> the dogs will quiet down. Let me apologies. So, yeah, and, you know, I'm a neurobiologist. And anytime you sit there, and you can look at the ecosystem of this person's great great grandparents has something to do with how their cortex works in a tenth of a second. Whoa, this is really interesting stuff in terms of how long lasting these influences are. Mm -hmm. And what would uh, um, I'd like to, to ask you about the ability to protest? Because uh, um, does it also depend on culture or? on some other factors, because, you know, we, we hear a lot of criticism. Um, and Russian people are sometimes condemned for not being able to, to stand up against Putin's regime. Um, and we see that in different nations, the ability to protest um, takes di different peri periods of time. Uh, there are protests in Iran right now, but but actually we know that that Iranian uh, women um, were enduring like uh, 40 years of uh, of that suppression before they they decided to stand up uh, what's where is that moment when when the human being is able to stand up and fight for for their rights uh, and uh, cannot tolerate um, the suppression of his of, or her dignity, and what does it depend on? Well, one version of it is it takes things getting so bad that finally people have nothing to lose. Uh, the whole idea that all reform does is undercut revolution. If it gets bad enough, um, you know, being sent into the regime's prisons are no worse than continuing to live in the regime's cities and towns. That's one factor. Another is if there's an event that triggers things, you know, some 20-year-old student steps out and shoots the Archduke of Austria-Hungary in the chest and the entire world explodes. Or <clears throat> like the Arab Spring, it was started by this one fruit seller in Tunisia who set fire to himself in protest. And, you know, over the next year, a dozen different Arab heads of states collapsed. Or the, so it can take a singular event. It can take a singular charismatic leader. It can take a singular, really scary charismatic leader or a really inspirational one like a Gandhi. But it's got to be within a background of things have gotten so bad that hope feels like a stupid, foolish thing to still be having. I think that's when it happens. Um, but other, other uh, nations, like other rebel nations, as uh, uh, um, knowing the, the, the recent history of Ukraine, we see that um, like every 10 years at least, there is some kind of, of a revolution and, and people are not able to tolerate the uh, the suppression for a longer period of time. Um, is it something uh, to do with, uh, with um, uh, neurobiology or it's 
or, or just as a new set of values, because for, for many decades Ukraine was a part of, uh, of Soviet Union and was suppressed, and after, after that um, it exploded. Um, you know, from my perspective, how I think about the world, you don't have to choose between is it neurobiology or is it values mm -hmm. or is it history? or is it your childhood experience, or is it your fetal life? All of those, you know, if within a day of birth, you were being raised differently from somebody on the other side of the planet because of your ancestors' cultures 500 years ago and the ecosystem 2,000 years ago, what that means is from the first day of life, culture and ecology and history from centuries ago are already influencing how you're building your brain and what kind of brain you're going to have when you were a 40 year old they they all turn into the same thing an amazing study and this is one that's like so outrageous in the united states um, there's a whole literature showing that by the time children begin kindergarten, when they're about five years old, if you come from a poor family, already your brain development has been slower than if you come from a wealthy family, especially a part of the brain called the frontal cortex, which has to do with self-control and impulse control and emotional regulation. And at age five, there's already a difference in the brain imaging. There's already a difference in the sort of tasks that you see. Okay, oh my God, that's totally outrageous. By age five, you were already screwed on the average if your parents were poor. And then they showed the same thing in three-year-olds. And then they showed the same thing in six month old kids. And last year, there was a paper that came out, a new technology that allows you to do brain imaging on fetuses. You can't get a whole lot of detail, but you can get brain size overall. And in a fetus, in a second trimester fetus, the wealth or poverty of parents are already influencing brain development because they're already influencing the stress hormone levels in mom's bloodstreams mm -hmm. that are getting into nutrition, probably like mm -hmm. economics and like the the there's inflation and thus the economy gets worse. And as a result, this fetus, their brain is going to be smaller by the time they're born. Like all of these influences interconnect in these crazy ways. Um, you know, <laughs> we're biological machines. We're biological machines where all we do is interact with environment. And that's what you wind up getting. Um, who are you? Well, it has something to do with like what you had for breakfast this morning but it also has something to do with how loudly your mother sang to you and what life was like when you were a fetus and what your ancestors were doing and which genes you got as a result. It's, it's incredibly interesting. Okay, and if we are machines, uh, is there any possibility to fix ourselves? Let's, uh, um, let's speak about Russian people, for example. Um, Many of them feel themselves as hostages, and like it's it's a feeling of helplessness. I don't know if it's um, learned help, helplessness, helplessness or real one, but they they feel that they cannot do anything. They uh, and thousands of, of of people feel the same. Uh, so um, when they are mm, in in the current turmoil, they prefer to escape, to flee the country, to run away, rather than stand up and protest. Um, is, is there a possibility to fix that uh, feeling of uh, despair and helplessness? Yeah, but the not hostage, surprisingly. The, the hostage syndrome. Exactly. Um, it's not easy. And, you know, for, for people who care about demography, um, in the last 50 years or so, the two most interesting things is the early 1990s after the Soviet Union collapsed and because social capital 
went down, people stopped trusting each other, people felt as if they had no group effectiveness, whatever. The life expectancy in Russia in the early 90s went down five years, and it was mostly among men, and it's what people in the business call diseases of despair, mm -hmm. alcohol, violence, suicide, heart disease. And the other demographic example is in the last 10 years, life expectancy has been going down in the United States, mostly among white, older men with poor education because of alcohol, suicide, violence, heart disease, all of that. So like this sense of despair and helplessness is, is a total disaster. What I think is historically like one of the great ways in which change can occur is as soon as people find out um, you're not the only one, you're not alone. I think that had so much to do with the Arab Springs where like in Algeria, the guy had been like a dictator for 30 years and he was gone in a week. In Romania, Kisescu disappeared in a week from when the first protest started because of media. You could text 10 friends who would text 10 friends and half the country would be yeah, but some, know, sometimes, it's not, sometimes it's not that simple. We, uh, we have another example. For example, Belarus with, uh, with this dictator named Lukashenko and uh, the scenario that happened in Belarus looked like exactly like in Tunisia or in Egypt. Uh, but it ended up um, in a different way. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't always succeed. Probably most of the time it doesn't succeed. And the people who start it wind up having their heads broken in or spend the rest of their life in exile or something. And, and desperate. And like, like the, 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 the phenomena of the national psychological trauma, when, um, when millions of, of people feel that uh, they were they felt united and they felt that they matter and they they had an illusion that they can they they are not alone and they can change something but uh then it's all gone and like the that horrible feeling of uh the the nation united in its despair yep is it and all that it, does a vicious circle completely because if there's that despairing um, you've been trained not to say who caused it, they caused it. Those are the people who caused it. And all that does is, yeah, just a vicious circle of making it worse. Um, and I, I don't know if it's like historically something people are aware of much in Russia, but at least in the West, um, in 1914, the first Christmas in World War I, the truce, the Christmas truce that occurred in France, between German and British soldiers. Mm -hmm. It's an unbelievable story. Um, it was the first Christmas of the war and like the kings and the Pope and everyone said, okay, we're going to have a truce. All the fighting will stop for Christmas Eve and for a few hours before that. A few hours before so that all the soldiers in the trenches could come out to the no man's land in between and retrieve the bodies of their dead and take them back. And then they get to pray at Christmas and then they go back to having their war. And really documented photographs, soldiers, letters, letters home, all of that. They came out as soon as the, as soon as the firing stopped to get their dead back. And then they started helping the other side carry their dead back. And then the two sides started helping each other dig in the frozen ground. And before you knew it, they were having Christmas together and they were praying together and they were exchanging gifts and sharing food. They exchanged weapons. They exchanged uniforms. They played football the next day. There's photographs of these troops playing it. And the day after and the day after, the troops refused to go back to fighting World War I. And this didn't break up until the officers showed up and said, we will shoot you unless you start fighting again. And it happened in this and pocket. Did they rebel against the officers? No, and that's what they should have done. That's who yeah. they should have been shooting. Absolutely. And the reason they didn't is because here was this one pocket of trench warfare. 
and 20 miles was another pocket and 20 miles. And I'm, I'm fascinated by this having happened historically. I've read some of the letters that these soldiers wrote home. It's, it's amazing history. But if cell phones had existed then in each one of these pockets, somebody would have texted their cousin saying, We're, we don't want to go back fighting either. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We're not. They would have stopped World War I if every little one of those pockets could have known nobody else wants to go back to fighting this war. And instead, you have officers showing up saying, you are traitors and the fatherland, you were abandoning it and all of that. If there, had, if there were cell phones in 1914, World War I would have stopped right then because people would have known I'm not the only one who's feeling this way. We're not the only ones who are feeling this way. And yeah, it doesn't always work. And Belarus is a disaster with that. And like they were crushed in the last few years. Um, but that's one of the great ways by which uh, things can work. On the other hand, um, you know, in the 19, right around the same time in the early 1990s, if everybody from a Hutu tribe in Rwanda had a cell phone and people didn't at the time, and if everybody could have like texted each other saying the genocide has started, let's get going, uh, they would have killed twice as many Tutsi in half the time. So everyone being able to organize, you know, sometimes you drive the colonial powers and you're India and you're free. And sometimes you got the Rwandan genocide, you know, it's not, it can go either way. It's not always a good thing, but it's almost always a powerful thing. Yeah, probably. But uh, unfortunately, people who are fighting each other in, uh, in Ukraine, the population of Eastern Ukraine is Russian speaking people. And the soldiers uh, fighting in Russian army, they are Russian speaking as well. So there is completely no, no difference, no genetic difference, no cultural difference be, uh, be, between those people. And they do have cell phones. So, uh, but, uh, but the, yeah. the people from, from the Russian side, they are, some of them, most of them, are so, zombified, so much zombified by, by the propaganda. So does, does it mean that uh, after we, we have the cell phones and social media, people could could be more could could have become more vulnerable to to brainwashing to conspiracy theories to propaganda um, Absolutely. Is, is there is there an explanation for that why why um, why could it, could that happen it's the exact same thing if you sit there and you think you know what it's really terrible that this country isn't being run by white people anymore. And it's really terrible that there's all these non-Christians here and all of that. It really gets under my skin when I see that. Oh my God, they think the same thing. They think the same thing. They think suddenly I can get online and there's these white nationalist neo-Nazi websites and there's lots of other... And, let's all get guns and try to like take over the Capitol in Washington, DC. Or if you're sitting there saying, you know what, this war is stupid. These people in charge, they're doing it for power. They're doing it for money. They're not doing it because they care about us. And they're just gonna like get me killed if I go off to the war. And if you suddenly discover everybody else is thinking the same thing, you know, Power comes from collective action, but it could be a terrible thing or it could be a great thing. And, you know, when a whole bunch of, in the United States at least, when a whole bunch of 60-year-old white Christian men who used to have good jobs and factories and no longer do and didn't finish high school, as soon as they can all talk to each other, uh, you get Donald Trump, you get a very scary country because suddenly they all... So collective action is great, but be very careful what collective action you hope for because uh, it, can go, it can go either way. Mm, I was impressed a, a lot um, listening to one of your uh, lectures, I, I, I guess, w w when, when you describe that the war is actually... Mm, 
rather new phenomena to this world. So, and the, the humanity existed for, for thousands of years without um, the necessity to fight each other. Um, until recently, we, we thought that actually the, the, the real age of wars is over. And like in, in 21st century, that bloody wars like we had in, 20s, in 20th century are now no longer possible. Um, is, is it just a naive dream or, or um, do you think it's possible uh, for, for, for the population, for the humanity to, um, to achieve that, um, uh, those values or those uh, um, ways of thinking, of collective thinking probably, to, um, uh, to stop admiring violence, to stop glorifying, uh, uh, glorifying violence, to stop um, glorifying wars and war heroes and war criminals as well. Yeah. Um, you know, it can change. I saw that you interviewed Steven Pinker, who's wonderful and he's such an interesting guy and like he's so smart and such a good writer. And I happen to completely disagree with him about this issue of when did warfare start? He's mm -hmm. from one camp that says it's 2 million years old, other camp that says it was invented 10,000 years ago with agriculture. And I think that's absolutely the case. And when you really look at the data, and in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, he did some, some things with his numbers there that kind of made his, his hypothesis a lot stronger than it actually was. But nonetheless, um, he thinks what has made the world a more peaceful place and a wonderful place is the Enlightenment, Western European Christian culture over the last 500 years. That's why it's a better planet. I wonder what he's been thinking in the last seven months since Russia went into Ukraine. And ooh, the great peace, the great peace after World War II. Some of it also was the great peace because the great powers learned something after World War II, which is get somebody else to fight your war for you. And I remember a period, I, some of my work, I, I've worked on and off in East Africa for 30 years. And there was a period where Ethiopia and Somalia were at war with each other. And Ethiopia had a Marxist government and Somalia was Western oriented capitalists. And these guys had Soviet weapons and these guys had American weapons. And there were a couple of revolutions. And five years later, it was the opposite direction. And now <laughs> they had the Soviet weapons and like, who cares as long as the country is willing to go along with us with the votes in the UN and we can whatever, we'll send the guns to you, we'll send the guns to you. It's not our kids who are getting killed. So Pinker ignores the whole invention of, you know, franchising out your, your wars elsewhere. But Ukraine now even does not that myth. Here's tanks in Europe crossing borders again, like people like him were saying, this will never happen again. Ooh, European Union, we've learned about all the economic advantages, how great it is to have open borders. And yeah, it's 70 years ago all over again. So like not a whole lot necessarily changes really long term, but then you get amazing examples. The one I love is like Sweden. In like 1800, the Swedes were like the most crazy, violent, badass people in all of Europe. And like Peter the Great, all he was doing was trying to like contain the Swedes. And they got completely trounced in a couple of wars over the next few decades. And in effect, they sat there as a country and said, you know what? We're not actually very big. And like all of our 18 year olds are getting killed and we're not harvesting our crops because we keep trying to like annex Poland and make it part of the Swedish empire. And this is stupid. Let's stop doing this. And the Swedes became the Swedes with their like uh, with the Swedish economic experiment. And it's like Scandinavia is the best place on earth to live now. That means, I'm sorry, that means that the national character we've been um, talking about can change. And as we saw um, Germans, 
for example, uh, during the, the First and Second World War were um, considered to be mm, rather brutal, uh, but the, that kind of genetic memory can, can go not only to the negative direction, but to the positive direction as well. And there you have Germany being the ones, you know, welcoming in immigrants more than any other EU country, because we know what our grandparents did. When we were little, we found out what happened in the 1930s and the 1940s. And even though we didn't do it, we still feel the weight of this. Yeah, absolutely. It could change in that sense. That, does it mean that the, the military defeat can change not only the social texture, but also some, mm, some mm, biological uh, um, elements, uh, some like pe pe people can, can genetically change? Well, I don't think so much genetically because again, you know, genes actually don't have a whole lot to do with behavior or genes by themselves. People, mm -hmm. people have way too much faith in how powerful genes are. But what you see are commonalities. In 1800, maybe if you were a Swede and you had a biological makeup where you were very into hierarchy and very into that, what you were proud of being as a Swede is we just defeated Peter the Great in some battle, or we just annexed Poland and all of that, and we're great. And it could be the same exact biology and somebody with the same liking for hierarchy or whatever, who sits there now and says, Sweden, we're the best. We've got the lowest infant mortality rate in the world. Like what form the chauvinism takes it can go in completely different directions. A great example of this, um, when Nelson Mandela was first let out of prison um, and he was negotiating secretly with the South African government, this would be for independence, but where everybody was saying, you know what, in about a year or so, this is gonna be a black ruled country, you're gonna be in charge of it. Here, let's start figuring out how this is going to happen. And one of the most important things Mandela did was negotiate with this Afrikaans general who was a leader of this right-wing white militia. And mm -hmm. he had 80,000 Afrikaans farmers with guns and whether or not there was gonna be a civil war afterward was pretty much in his hands. And this was a guy who had killed a lot of people and somehow he and Mandela got along and it and he Mandela convinced him form a party form a political party and you will lead the opposition and every time we do something you hate you get to have it in the front page of your newspapers and somehow he convinced the guy who set up the meeting between Mandela and this brutal murderous monster of this like his brother the guy's twin brother, who was a Protestant minister who had been a leader of the anti-apartheid movement for 30 years, and his general brother had had to step in more times to tell his death squads, don't kill my brother, I know he's at the top of your list. So here, they're totally different. They're both leaders. They were both willing to die for their principles. They were both so... There's a similar biology there, but and probably similar genetics. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, they both ran for pol parliament against each other. Um, and the conservative, the neo fascist one, won the first election, and his brother won the next one. But somewhere along the way, that same biology went in very different directions. So some things don't change. Um, but the behavior cha exactly. changes. They can look exactly the same in very different circumstances. Oh my God, like Germans trying to make up for the sins of their grandparents have the same fervor with which like their grandparents were crushing Poland. But the, uh, the, 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 the huge military defeat was needed to change the behavior of uh, um, each and 
each German and, and the nation as as whole. Plus, you know, other hiccups, for all we know, 50 years from now, Germany is going to be the most militaristic country in the world again. And it's all going to be built around make Germany great again. And contemporary neo-Nazis there certainly think that. But you get other hiccups. I mean, if you were German growing up in the 1950s, you were very conformist because it was a very conformist society. If you were German growing up in the 1960s, the 60s were happening. And the 60s were happening all over the world. And you were part of a generation protesting and shutting down your universities and all of that. And among other things, you were learning that it was okay to hate your parents and tell them they were monsters. And this was the perfect one because your parents had done something 20 years earlier mm -hmm. when they were, and you could say, so what were you doing during the war? No, what were you really doing? And that was where this gigantic shift happened. That was the generation that first became the Germans who were saying, we did nothing, but we have to make up for this. And it just happened that the next generation grew up at a time where it was like cool to like take drugs and have sex and hate your parents. Like suddenly that's like the thing you do. And thus you hate them for what they did in like the 1940s. Whereas in the United States, what was going on was the same exact thing. And you were hating your parents for voting for Republicans who were making a war in Vietnam. This is a cultural stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, things along the way. Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, your doc is is really fed up with with us uh, talking for <laughs> for that long. Uh, uh, can you show it? Because I, I uh, I've heard it and I I, I desperately want to see it. Uh, the doc. <laughs> um, there's two of them. Uh, two of them. They're both out on the deck right now. Let me see if they come. Safi, come. Safi, Safi, come. Here he comes. Come here. Come here. Come here. He's. Oh, it's lovely. <laughs> one of those. And yeah, the other one is a little dog who just barks uh -huh. all the time. Are you are you a dog person? Um, yeah, much, much more. Uh, if uh, cho choos choosing bet between dogs and cats, definitely not a cat person. I'm allergic to, uh, to cats. So <laughs> thanks so much. The, 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 Thank you. Was such a pleasure talking to you. Well, likewise. Good luck with everything. Thank you. Good. Take care. Bye bye.